all scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for, for instruction, instruction in righteousness, righteousness, that the man of Yah may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is Watchman of Yah. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him or her, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the real Hakadesh says to the churches. Joyce Meyer Joyce Meyer is a lukewarm, puke Christian preacher who is leading thousands, if not millions, of others to become lukewarm, puke Christians resembling herself. She is incompetent in biblical doctrine after 45 years of ministry. Her ignorance still shows. What exactly is a lukewarm gospel producing lukewarm Christians? How can we know for sure who is a lukewarm preacher? They preach only what people want to hear. The good things. They avoid subjects that are controversial, hard to swallow, that turn people away from them because they want popularity and money. They don't mind that this will result in souls going to hell or being deceived in these last days. The preacher is on their way to hell themselves and they are taking many with them. They have sold their soul, their congregation, and the Savior out to the devil, like Judas. Now, is it on purpose or is it true ignorance? At the end of the day, does her intent really matter? Her audience is still being fooled and led right into a trap. Take a listen. This question, what happens after you die? I think many people right now are just, there's some fear and there are a lot of questions, so mm -hmm. I think it's a great conversation to have. I went back to the Bible, which I mean, I've studied this before, but there's a lot of really great scriptures that tell us that we have nothing to fear, unless, of course, we're not living for God. And the Bible does tell us that we have two choices, heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there are people that like to say they don't believe in hell, but it's in the Bible. You're either going to believe the Bible or you're not going to believe the Bible. You can't just pick and choose what you right. You know what you want. And then there's people who say, well, I just don't believe that a good God would send somebody to hell. Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. People make their own choices. And um, that doesn't mean that we have to live perfect lives to go to heaven. The Bible says in order to be saved, you must believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose from the dead and confess it with your mouth. And obviously, if you truly believe in Jesus. I mean, truly believe in Jesus. And then you're going to want to serve him. You're going to want to know his word. And you're going to want to serve him. And the more revelation you get on how much God loves you and how good you are and how good he is, uh, the more you want to do the right thing. But even in wanting to do the right thing, we still never live perfect lives. Right. And so the Bible promises us that if our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, which it's in there if you're truly saved, then you're never going to come up for judgment concerning your salvation. But there's a lot of scriptures that still talk about that after we die, there will be a judgment. We will face God and give an account of our lives. And, well, let and, me ask you a question just to clarify that, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people have fear about mm -hmm. is, will will I make it or not? You know, <laughs> have have I done enough good? Or how do I know that my, my name is in the book? Yeah. So we will all face judgment, but there is that question of what happens when I get to that gate? Yeah. You know, what is... And beautiful. But one of my favorite scriptures, when we talk about this judgment, Romans 14, 12 says that we will all come before God and give an account of our lives. So I, don't, I won't give an account for somebody else. I'll give an account for me. But I know I'm born again. I know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm doing the best. I know how to, to serve God. I repent when I make mistakes. Uh, yeah, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm, you know, I make mistakes all sure. the time. But, but our right standing with God is not based on our perfection. It's based on our faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. He that knew no sin became sin that we might be made right with God through Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, we will have this judgment, but it's not, we're not being judged there for our salvation. Not people that are, that are born again. Right. Uh, people that aren't are going to have a different experience. But we are going to be judged for our works. And I think that's interesting that we're going to have rewards for our works that we've done in the body here on earth. Are we're going to lose those rewards. But 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, in the Amplified Classic Edition, I love this scripture. It says, According to the grace, the special endowment for my task of God bestowed on me, like a skillful architect and master builder, I laid the foundation, and now another man is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon that foundation. 
For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So let's just say we're born again and Jesus becomes the foundation of our lives. Mm -hmm. But if anybody builds on that foundation, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. So we all build some kind of life, but what kind of life are we building? You know, there's many people who say they believe in God. They believe they've accepted Christ as their Savior, but they still live very selfish, self-centered lives where they're really not doing anybody else any good or trying to help anybody else in any way. The work of each one will become plainly and openly known, shown for what it is, for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it, because it will be revealed with fire. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but there's a place in Revelations where Jesus is depicted as having eyes like fire. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this could represent that when we, when we stand before God on that judgment day, that that will be him looking at us and our works. And the fire will trust and test and critically appraise the character and the worth of the work that each person has done. Now, this to me is good. If the work which anybody has built on this foundation, any product of his effort, whatever survives this test, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of all of it, losing his reward, though he himself will be saved, but only as one who has passed through the fire. So basically this is telling me that, you know, if I'm born again, I'm born again. And if I'm truly born again, believe in Christ, trust him for the forgiveness of my sins, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. But who in their right mind wouldn't want all the rewards right. that God could give him? I mean, I have no idea what they are, but... Yeah. I'm sure they're probably pretty awesome. So and this I, is so much to take in. Yeah. So, so the the what you're talking about is not a yes or no to get into heaven based on our works. Mm -hmm. It is not that. That is not how we get into heaven. No. But it is a judgment of our life that will talk about the the rewards that we receive once yeah. we're in heaven. Right. And I don't. You you rarely ever hear this. Yeah. Talked about. But um, I think that these works that are going to be judged. I think they're going to be judged based on motives. In other words, people they live too much on the surface and don't think very much about why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we just think, well, you know. I've done this and I've done that. Like, you know, there's a lot of people you can say, do you believe you'll go to heaven when you die? Well, you know, I, I try to live a good life. You know, I try to do this, I try to do that. And that, that tells me they don't really understand. You know, you, you can't really love God and appreciate what Jesus has done in your life and not want to do anything back for him. We don't do good works to get God to love us. We do them because we're so amazed at how much he does love us. And I wish that this was taught more in all churches. We have to know who we are in Christ before we can ever really, you, you have to be made right with God before you can do anything right. right. I mean, how many people live their whole life and never really, she said we have two choices. We either go to heaven or hell. Those choices are made by our profession of Yoshua as Savior and the way we live our lives. Whether we live in sin or choose not to sin daily. Though she said heaven or hell is a choice, apparently living in holiness is not a choice, but happens by understanding the grace and love of God as the reason to start living for God. Without knowing what the grace of God is, you apparently can't live holy. In other words, the choice is not your own. But you're waiting for God to do something convincing and emotionally moving, perhaps. The reality is that you make your own decision to live in sin or not. You don't wait to have a grand feeling of love or thankfulness before deciding that you will not commit that sin anymore. In fact, belief in God is proven by obedience to God. Another fact, sometimes God will be silent and will give you nothing and you still have to prove that you love him by your obedience. Isaiah 26.8 Lord, we show our trust in you by obeying your laws. Our heart's desire is to glorify your name. And she does not say clearly what it means to live for God. It's very vague. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15 is exactly what Yahushua said. And that's very specific. This is obedience to God's laws. In fact, she preaches against the law, calling any observance to the law legalistic. Tonight, I want to approach the subject of freedom from legalism. Because I really believe when the Bible talks about freedom, a lot of times that's what it's talking about in the New Testament. You see, under the Old Covenant, people lived under laws and rules and regulations. It started with 10 commandments, and those then had about 2,200 sub-commandments. A lot of it was attached to legalism. Legalism. So now we're going to talk about legalism. Personally, as a teacher of the Bible, I think that legalism is a difficult subject to teach on because if I teach you that you're free from the law, I also have to teach you that God has called us to live a holy life. So to try to teach people to be holy and not be legalistic, sometimes you've got to find a really fine place to cut that. And the only thing that I know to tell you is that the balance is always found in learning how to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you. I cannot give you enough rules and regulations, nor can I take enough rules and regulations away from you to help you live a balanced life if you won't learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And religion, without really having a relationship with Jesus, and when I say religion, I'm not talking about your religion, my religion, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Method. I'm not talking about all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a religious mindset that says, I have to keep all these rules and regulations for God to be happy with me. And if I'm good enough, then God will be happy with me. And if I'm good enough, then God will love me. But when I'm not good, then God doesn't love me. And so if I'm good, then I feel good about myself. And if I'm bad, then I feel bad about myself. That is not the system that God operates on. That's, we have been set free from the uh, 
the laws in the Bible that covered things like that, what we call the ceremonial law, set free from following rules and regulations and having to honor certain days and feast days and rules about diet, rules about material you can wear together and material you can't wear together and what you can't eat, what you can't eat and all that stuff. But we have not, understand me, we have not been set free from the moral law. The Ten Commandments are just as valuable today as they were then. Come on. I heard somebody say one time, can you, can you imagine anybody standing up and teaching on the Ten Commandments? I thought, well, yeah. Of course, she must say that she agrees with the Ten Commandments. But any preacher will say the rest of it you can do away with. However, within a law, there are sexual sins too. Should we do away with that? Is bestiality okay now? Does God approve of homosexuality? That's also part of the law. These people like to focus on what we eat and circumcision, but it's, it's a whole lot more to it than that. He also says not to muzzle an ox while it's grinding out the corn, and Paul lets us know what that means to us today. So it is our job, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do this, to figure out what the law means to us right now. There is a legalistic way and an obedience way of doing things. The legalistic way is thinking that your sins are not forgiven when you repent and in order to get right with God when you do sin, you have to obey the law. The obedience way is first being saved by the blood of Yahushua and trusting in his saving blood and name, then doing what he commands. And when you sin by mistake, not as a lifestyle choice, but a mistake, you ask forgiveness for that sin and repent with the intention to change and you know that you are right with God when you do this. And that is because of the blood of Yoshua Mashiach. This is what that looks like for those who don't know. This is what Yoshua has taught us. You are living your life in holiness, for example, obeying the Ten Commandments, abstaining from all appearances of evil. Then you made a mistake. Perhaps you were angry at someone and used language you shouldn't have. You will then feel convicted. The Holy Spirit will not allow you to feel comfortable when you sin. And on top of that, you already know you have to stop using that language with your own intelligence. You should know that God will not like that. The flesh may rise and give you excuses to overlook what you said. But as I stated before, the Holy Spirit will not allow you to get comfortable in your sin. So you submit to the Holy Spirit and you decide to pray a prayer of repentance, asking Abba Yahweh to forgive you for your outbursts of anger and whatever it is you said. And you tell him that basically you're not going to do that again and work on your own self-control and you end the prayer in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. You do this quickly so that Yahushua's blood can cover you and so that you don't give a foothold for the devil. Yahushua said to repent quickly, which means don't waste time to repent when you know you're wrong. Don't sit around making excuses for what you just did. Don't sit around trying to figure out how to make yourself feel better because you happen to feel a little bit guilty for what you just did. You're supposed to feel somewhat guilty. Um, you just sinned, and if you continue in that way, you'll go to hell. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you down a holy path. And that's what that looks like. But how would you do that if you listen to preachers tell you that once saved, always saved? Over time, with growth and maturity, you should be seeing that you are not repenting of the same thing over and over again, and there should be longer periods of time between your mistakes. This is proof that you're growing. Joyce makes a distinction between how believers will be judged and how non-believers will be judged. Now, if you are about to die and you repent and believe on Yahushua right quick like the thief on the cross and then die, then the only thing you had time to do was believe. I don't think that's a goal in life. It's gambling with your eternal soul. Focusing on believers, all professing salvation through Yahushua HaMashiach, Yahushua said in Matthew 7, 21-23, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. This is judgment for believers, Christians, those proclaiming to be saved and knows Jesus or Yahushua HaMashiach as we call him. So how then can Joyce claim that believers don't get judged based off of their salvation? Well, Yahushua clearly states that he does. Joyce uses verse 22, On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. She uses that to say your works don't matter, your motives do. And I'm going to tell you, both your motives and your work matter. 
Since you're alive and listening to this right now, why don't we learn more how to judge ourselves before some get to this point mentioned in the previous verses? Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Now I know he starts this off with false prophets, but you can also think of uh, false preachers such as Joyce Meyer. So here Yahushua is teaching us how to judge righteous judgment and test the prophets or the preachers. This extends to any minister and ministry, and we can use this to judge ourselves. Self-judgment is a priority because... Matthew 7, 1 through 5, do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is a standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log of your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye, when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrites, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with a speck in your friend's eye. So before judging others' fruit, we must first inspect ours and get it in order. Plus, the only person who will stand before God is the actual individual. Now, I know I'm talking a lot about judging, and people these days don't like to hear that word. But this teaching is not my own. It's the word of God, and it's necessary to understand Yah in whole. Judging, self-assessment, can keep you out of trouble later on and free from surprises such as learning that Yahushua doesn't even know you and immediately departing from his presence and going to hell. Judging righteous judgment is using the word of God as a standard for right or wrong, good or evil, not your own opinion, not your feelings, not whatever the world or your society or culture is doing. And to be able to do this, you yourself must be free of the sin you're judging someone else for. So I'm judging Joyce using the word of God, which means that the Lord God is judging her, not me, since this is not my word, without leading people to hell. So I'm not being hypocritical by the grace of Yah, no background not in Yeshua's name, and I'm inspecting the fruit, and it's bad, all bad. She needs to repent if she can, and her followers need to flee her evil church. That's judging righteous judgment. And why is the fruit bad? Because she herself is headed to hell, and she's leading a lot of people there too. She refers to scriptures which says that we will be judged by our works, whether good or bad, by quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But we're going to take that chapter in proper context by reading before and after that part. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 23. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Mashiach. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with one another. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only Yahweh's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was Yahweh who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that Yah makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both Yahweh's workers, and you are Yah's field. You are Yah's building. Because of Yah's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Yahushua HaMashiach, Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. 
But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be safe, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of Mashiach and that the spirit of Yah lives in you? Yahweh will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for Yah's temple is holy and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to Yah. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in a snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader. For everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future. Everything belongs to you and you belong to Mashiach and Mashiach belongs to Yahweh. Now that we have read this in context, it should be clear that the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul to teach against jealousy and arguments among the brethren and picking favorites. The only one who can be placed upon a pedestal is Yahushua HaMashiach, not Paul, Apollos, or anyone else. Their job and ours and all who preach the gospel are building upon the foundation that Yahushua HaMashiach, who many call Jesus, is the Savior. The part about judging the works in this chapter is concerning those who preach the gospel. Their works will be judged and will be known what quality of work they have done as far as building up the church is concerned. There is a general judgment for everyone and specifically there is a judgment for those who serve Yah as well. So in context, this is what Paul is referring to. I think that someone who started this whole talk with how many years she's been in ministry or studying the Bible she know to pick a scripture reference in this context. There are scripture references about judgment that pertain to the general population of believers. This just isn't one of them. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping a wall of flames. This verse does not mean once saved, always saved, because at this point, the person has already been accepted into heaven. But first, before being accepted into heaven, a person must hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, because many are going to also hear, depart from me, I never knew you, and that means they're not going to make it to the part of the interview where Yahushua tests their works. That comes first, and that is a judgment of your salvation, since that's the terminology she wants to use. It's a play on words, of course. Salvation is salvation, and living in sin is not. It's that simple. But the first step before you enter those gates is determine if you're really saved or living in sin. And according to the verse following that line, it has to do with your own actions. Preachers who are practicing witchcraft to do false miracles, for example, will hear, Depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. I said before this scripture is talking about Christians. Non-believers are not doing miracles in the name of Jesus or Yeshua. Only those professing to be saved and love God are pretending to be saved while living in sin. They think they know God, but they don't. But you see, Joy skips over step one to point out only step two. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. The preachers, teachers, prophets, etc. are supposed to be teaching holiness. They're supposed to be encouraging you to live holy correcting you when you're not and encouraging you to continue on that's what paul did if they are leading you to live a life that doesn't include repenting of your sins if their messages are not convicting you to change if all they do is make you feel good about your sinful self if they don't even touch on the subject of homosexuality when they have homosexual couples sitting in their audience or they don't strictly warn and then turn away those who refuse to repent then they are destroying the temple by causing the children to sin. Many are going to hell for this. And unless that preacher repents and corrects their messages, they are going to pay the price of every soul they led to hell. They are not entering heaven unless they repent. Yah's temple is holy, strictly holy. It is not conforming to this world. And I have yet to find out if Joyce has taught against the popular sexual sins of today, namely homosexuality. I bring this up to warn about the boiling black blood plague, a plague for homosexuals and everyone supporting that lifestyle. 
I've spoken about it before. However, the original warning came from a different prophet, and you can find it by searching for the term boiling black blood plague. It is a plague Yah has sensed. It has no cure. The blood will appear black. The temperature will be high, hence boiling black blood. And it spreads through homosexual encounters. And they spread it to heterosexuals. And like I said, Yah says that those who support them will get it too. And the last thing is death. So if you have or end up knowing someone who has it, they are going to have to openly repent in order to make it into heaven. They'll have to tell how they got it and all. Of course, they will have to be saved. Then when they die, they will enter heaven. Yah says it's incubating in the blood right now. Also, if you're a faithful spouse married to an unfaithful spouse or forced into a sexual encounter, you will be spared the disease. So now is a good time to abstain if you're not married. And now is a good time to quit adultery if you are. Now is a good time to get out of a homosexual relationship and seek help from everything causing those evil desires. Apparently, a lot of people are going to have this disease and be ended from it and it's going to be really gross. The when, I don't know when this will happen. I just know that it will happen. So repent and change your life if you're in this category before it's activated. Good luck getting Joyce to warn you, although she does say that she gives messages that are on God's heart. If you believe that, then you must also believe that God doesn't want you to be warned of these things ahead of time. If you really do believe that, then may I suggest you read the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and consider that the warnings for the future, which we are in, are thousands of year old warnings. It's even more if you read the book of Enoch. Now what? Well, the popular preachers are dumb dogs that don't bark, so a tiny channel such as this is brought up. Anyways, just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the son of Yahweh and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit, who brings Yah's mercy to us. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Yahweh. Hebrews 10, 29-31 In the Amplified Version, It is a fearful and terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, incurring his judgment and wrath. Hebrews 10, 31 Again, the Amplified Version Trampling upon the blood of Yahushua is something only people who were once saved can do. This verse is not speaking to those who don't even believe in Yahushua. It's those who claim to be saved but continue to sin and think that Yahushua's blood gives them a license to sin, or rather, once saved, always saved, because you will make mistakes and sin at some point. But what you will do with this mentality of once saved, always saved is never repent of your sins and think that it's no longer necessary to do so. When in reality, if you live like this, you are doing exactly what Hebrews 10, 29 through 31 says. Understand we do know the God who says vengeance is mine, I will repay. That is Yahushua HaMashiach. That is his father Abba Yahweh. And that is the real Kakodesh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly, James 3, 1. Because we have to be examples of what we preach and preach holiness in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. Yahushua does not allow us to be hypocrites. So when a preacher is being hypocritical, they are ignoring a lot of warnings from the real Hakodesh, and that is evil. I use this verse a lot. Yahushua will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. But you know what you cannot find? You can't find any scripture that says Yahushua will turn away anyone who honors his father's laws and call upon his name. But there are many warnings and judgments against anyone who breaks Yah's laws in both the Old and the New Testament. In fact, it's just simply throughout the Bible. As I've said before, it's up to anointed preachers and teachers, etc. to properly teach what is relevant and why. I'm not saying you have to get circumcised or avoid pork or else you're going to hell because that's just not true. But I do know you have to obey the Ten Commandments and the sexual laws. And I do know Yah wants his children to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy now. 
It was his mercy for us to break it this entire time, and it was even his mercy for us to call upon his son's name as Jesus instead of his name that was given to him, Yahshua or Yahushua. Back to the Sabbath. It's not Sunday. It's Friday evening till Saturday evening. That doesn't change, and there's no debating it. Plus, there is a reason we are letting you know this. A watchman has to warn, and this warning has a little bit of teaching to catch you up a bit for your own understanding, especially if this is the first or only video of ours you're going to watch. At least you have been warned. And also, do your own research. In the Old Testament, Yah had those who broke the Sabbath law stoned to death to let everyone know to take it seriously. And it is also prophetically showing what will happen in the future. Death to those who break the Sabbath, yet follow another law. There is a death penalty for breaking a Sabbath. However, in the end times, that death penalty is the loss of your own soul. That other law is the Antichrist law. Obedience to it results in permanent separation from Yahweh, becoming reprobate, unable to be saved. This will happen in the future. During that part of the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist will have a worldwide law that everyone should go to their local Sunday church to worship him, and anyone who doesn't will be put to death. This is why I say read the book of Daniel. At this time, if you belong to Yahushua, you will know in your spirit not to go there even if you're still going there now. Plus, I'm warning that anyone who goes to a Sunday church so much as steps foot there at that time will accept the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is both a physical mark on the hand or forehead and the spiritual mark of worship. They go together. It is not one or the other. Again, they go together. The Antichrist has his day. It's Sunday. He will also call himself Jesus Christ. Remember, the elect would be deceived if possible. And the only reason that's not possible is the Holy Spirit inside of us. There's going to be more mind control in the atmosphere than there is right now. Lots of chaos from the blue bean rapture. And remember, this individual is seen as someone who is powerful enough to fix everything. He will be like God in the mind of those who are doomed. He will do miracles openly while calling himself Jesus Christ and making Sunday the Christian's holy day, a mandatory day of worship. Those who don't know this, you're going to have to learn quickly once you see this happening. But the goal is to spread the warning, so do your part. It's your friends and family who are going to be in the dark, not mine. That's why Christians are programmed to go to church on Sunday and to call the Messiah by a name that will be used by the Antichrist. He's going to call himself Jesus Christ, and he's going to demand worship, and many will worship him and take his mark. When this individual is using the name Jesus Christ, Yahweh will no longer answer any prayers in that name. You will have to use the name Yahushua, or you can say Yahshua, as long as it's Yah and not Yeh, as in Yeshua. That's not going to be it. If you're expecting to get your prayers answered by Yah, Use the name Yahshua or Yahushua. If you use the name Jesus Christ, the Antichrist will answer you. And that is not who you want to respond to you when you're trying to hide or need help. Yah has said it is getting more dangerous for his children to stay in the Sunday church and that his children should stop going now. And I will take a moment to explain that you have to use the name Yahushua against the aliens or non-humans, as I call them, during the time they do their thing, the blue bean rapture. And you have to use the name Yahushua to be protected against the zombies, plus the weapon we have already told you to use in other videos. We will likely go into that in another video all about zombie killing, but take this seriously. You are to have a personal relationship with God yourself at home. And when you're on the run, you're going to wish you had a personal relationship with God anyways. So get started now because you're going to need a lot of faith and help to survive what's coming. I can't emphasize this enough. You're gonna need faith. There are some preps you should make like a go bag as I've said before on this channel. But you're going to survive on faith in Yahushua HaMashiach. You're not going to be able to depend on your pastors who don't even know this information or who have sold out to the devil. The pastors and fake prophets and dreamers will realize they were wrong and be on the run as well, thinking of their own survival. The mind control is going to be much stronger than it is right now, not only in a general atmosphere, but specifically in the church building itself, 
Whoever goes will not resist worshiping the beast, and when they leave, they will have done that and be marked. They are going to do all the evil practices of the old pagan religions. It's going to be very evil. All that history about sacrifices and orgies will be there again in full. They will be reprobate, and this means they will have a very evil spirit, a fallen angel walking, living inside of them. If your friends and family end up going there, just know they are no longer the people you thought they were. They will turn you in, and you know you cannot stay at home. Unless, of course, they decide to do something else to you. Cannibalism will be a thing amongst the reprobate as well. An open thing, not a hidden thing. This is how a human becomes non-human. It may be glamorized in vampire movies and books, but it's simply an example of becoming a reprobate. And that's not cute. If you're living in a country where spiritual stuff is weird to you, then you need to get over it and realize there's more going on than what you recognize as possible. Because you're going to see it and you might as well be aware instead of trying to cope all of a sudden with surprises like that. Oh, and it's not just a movie or a game. It's an actual spirit tagging and following, waiting to act upon whoever invites it in, waiting to take over that individual and do whatever that spirit is to do, such as kill or murder or whatever. So avoid all appearances of evil, folks. You see the increase in crime, don't you? This stuff is actually dangerous. So my daughter had a dream about this years ago when she was five, she's now 16. And I remember it because it was the first time I've heard of this. In that dream, she said she was eating cereal and there were eyes everywhere in the cereal and on the box and basically everywhere. She then saw a man preaching in a church, but this man was completely black from head to toe, including his clothes. And he was very energetic or charismatic, just all over the place preaching something. And people really enjoyed the show he put on. There was a statue on a stage. It had eyes which could see and the eyes were looking all around. Then the preacher stopped his sermon and told everyone to bow down to the statue and they did and they gave gifts to the statue. So I understood the dream was about a fallen pastor who is completely black. He has no light inside of him. He is completely reprobate and no longer has any humanity in him at all. And the eyes are all spies. This shows the level of spying. So everyone is being watched and all the people in that church listening to that pastor were captivated by him and worshiped the idol of the beast. Well, they gave themselves to this evil so they were given into the evil. It was all so that a child could understand it. So just like in the book of Daniel, they were told to bow down to an idol or face death. It would be like that in the Sunday churches as well. The Sabbath is also a sign or a mark that you belong to Yahweh. And the devil copied this concept as usual and made his own mark out of the Sunday, which is actually ancient history. The days of the week we currently use were named after false gods. And the top false god in the false god world is the sun god. And that is the day the first Catholic church or the universal church as they were once known as made into a Christian holy day. A lot of things were changed, but I will not go into that here. The point is the Sabbath day will be something you have to know sooner or later because Yah is going to use that day in the future to bless his own children. Plus, if you want to be a bride of Yahushua now and get raptured in the true rapture instead of being fooled by that fake blue beam rapture that's coming, then you'd have to be a Shabbat keeper. All of Yahushua's bride, both Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, keep the Sabbath day holy is part of the Ten Commandments. Yahushua is coming for his bride on the Sabbath, but all of this requires deeper spiritual understanding. And as Paul stated, I can't speak to you as if you are spiritual, or rather as if you are ready for spiritual meat instead of just milk. Most viewers just want to hear a story about hell or aliens or something. Don't worry, you'll get to see the aliens one day, among other non-humans. But they don't really like humans except perhaps as food. The fact is they just want to dominate this earth and get rid of us all and send as many humans as possible to hell, Yahushua said, Matthew 18, 6 7. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world? Because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? And by the anointing of the real Kakadesh, Paul wrote that he tries to please everyone without breaking the law. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 through 22. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Mashiach. But I do not ignore the law of Yahweh. I obey the law of Mashiach. 
And some people separate the law of God from the law of Mashiach, but the Son and the Father are one, and there is no separation of law, which is holiness and righteousness, only a new blood covenant in Yahushua's blood, which the Father and the Son agree on. Continuing, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Mashiach. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Paul is stating that he does this by finding common ground with everyone. In no way would the Ruach HaKodesh allow Paul to live in sin or preach sin, which is to preach against the law. At Joyce's age and years in ministry, she should not be making mistakes all the time, as she says, which shows her own spiritual immaturity, lack of good, mature fruit, and lack of obedience to God, which is not something to brag about. Yet she thinks she could tell someone else how to please God or get into heaven. I said before on a different video, if you can't obey the rules of the Father, you can't live in his house. Why anyone would trust someone who admittedly and nonchalantly makes mistakes all the time to know whether or not they're going to heaven is beyond me. We don't earn our salvation, but we do try to keep it. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, and that's how you keep it. The reason why people fear to be judged by Yah is because they know deep down they ain't living right, and they don't believe God really accepts them like that. They may be living in obvious sins, and for such people, I say, just get rid of those that are obvious first. Then, as you grow, God will reveal to you what you need to work on. Do that if you want to start working out your own salvation. Yahushua says to do your best. That doesn't mean you don't start shedding sin. It means exactly what I just told you to do. Start with the obvious, such as if you are in a homosexual relationship and have those desires, Drop the relationship and pray to Yah for deliverance and work on that by not giving in to temptation. All avoidance of sin is not giving in to temptation. If you're addicted to something, get clean. Work on that. If you're easily angry, calm down daily. And take all of this to Yah in prayer to get delivered as you put the work into not doing those things. That would be actively doing your best. Remember, do not mock God. The truth is God does love you and he has given his only begotten son Yahushua as a sacrifice for sin so that you and I could be saved and live in his righteousness here on earth and in his heaven when we leave earth. So if you want to make it into heaven, you must be saved and stop sinning. God is not a cuddly teddy bear, a personal Santa. He is the pure, holy creator of all things. Money means nothing to Yahweh. He owns everything. He has great love and mercy for his children if you would just make the decision and strive to live holy. Obey him. It starts with a choice. Now, Joyce Meyer is a multimillionaire and a message like this doesn't make her any more rich. Sending souls to hell for Satan does. So you will not hear the truth from her. Yahushua said, be ye perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. Yahushua said this because in him, this is possible. Whereas Joyce just wants you to get up and try your best without ever telling anyone what Yah's standards are. His Ten Commandments are a good start. His sexual laws are also a place to look to, something that Joyce has not explicitly talked about, at least I can't find it. If you are living in sexual sin, but you got up and did your best, and your best was to continue to live in sexual sin, if you die that way, you are not entering heaven. You will be judged on your entire life, including your salvation, whether or not you took your salvation seriously. By living in continual sin, you are only proving that you don't take Yahushua's blood sacrifice seriously. You do get chances to repent and then start growing to bear fruit. If after some time you don't, if you refuse, you open yourself up to become a reprobate. If you keep silencing the rebuke of the real Kakodesh, eventually you will not hear her anymore and eventually she will walk out. That's when you become a reprobate. This takes time. Meanwhile, if you die with continual sin, you know by now you'll hear, Depart from me, I never knew you, from Yahushua HaMashiach. Joyce says she repents. How does she even know what to repent of since she doesn't acknowledge the law of God? If you're repenting of things that doesn't even matter, like putting away the grocery cart or going over budget on a grocery bill, maybe she repents of not buying a bracelet or buying a bracelet or whatever jewelry she says God wanted her to have. I have rolled my eyes so much by listening to her. This is nonsense. Yet she will not warn about homosexuality so that those souls could be saved. This is how you know who she really loves, herself, only. If Joyce truly believed in the Jesus of the Bible she preaches, she would have taken his word, his warnings, his instructions seriously. Because she does it, she is showing her own lack of belief in God. You know why I don't do the practices of a pagan religion? Because I don't believe in their false gods. Faith without works is dead. 
that right there is a judgment of your salvation. It's not whether or not Yahushua's blood sacrifice is enough to save. It is. It's about whether or not you chose to live in sin or in righteousness. Joyce is focused on the part where Yahushua is not concerned about what you do but your motives. That is incomplete. He will judge both motives and works. It is not one or the other. Though many would probably like it to be, but God is not a God who conforms to your idea of who he is. He is who he is, and you better learn it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew seven twenty one through 23. So it is your works that determine whether or not you are an obedient child of Yah or a worker of lawlessness, not just your motives. He literally uses the word worker. Your works matter. Don't let these false preachers tell you that you will not be judged based on your salvation. This verse clearly states that you will. Workers of lawlessness, evildoers, workers of iniquity are not saved, though they claim to be saved. And so first you got to determine whether or not the person is saved, and that's already a judgment on your salvation. Also, this is a play on words. It sounds right to say that you will not be judged based on your salvation. Doesn't it give you the fuzzies just thinking about how comforting that is? And it's all because we believe. So that means you don't have to stop sleeping with your boyfriend or stop smoking weed. So we can just stop feeling guilty when we do wrong things? Wow, what a deal. Dude, it's a fairy tale trap from hell. No, the Holy Spirit does not allow you to feel nothing when you are headed straight to hell and you claim to be saved. God will not take the blame for the fact that you went to hell. You will know that you were warned by the time you enter hell. Joyce totally misleads on the meaning of Yahushua HaMashiach's burning eyes. That part is not about judging the works of his people. That is wrath in his eyes and that is not for his children. Question, how does her audience not know this? Oh, it's because the book of Revelation is scary for a lot of Christians and they don't read it. Read it. She is mocking you with this explanation and mocking Yahushua's anger. For all who love the fuzzy wuzzy feelings, do you really think you want Yahushua to look at you with fiery eyes? Or maybe, maybe you'd rather he look at you with love? Those are two completely different things. He only looks at his enemies with fiery eyes, okay? Revelation 1 14 through 16. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Also, Revelation 19 11 through 21. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. Here he is introduced as judge and warrior. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of Yahweh, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. Yeah, I don't see Fuzzy Wuzzy here. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, Come! Gather together for the great banquet Yahweh has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive in a fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse, and the vultures all gorged themselves on dead bodies. This part has absolutely nothing to do with giving rewards to his children. Obviously. This is the wrath of the lamb, and there is nothing cute and cuddly about his wrath, how she could forget that, though she states that she has studied this Bible for how many years? 
So Joyce mentions the verses in the book of Revelation concerning the rewards Yahushua has. This is rewards for his children and those who are evil. Everyone is rewarded by what they do, good or evil. This is not just the children of God. She mentioned the Lamb's Book of Life. It's true, those who are saved from before the foundation of this earth are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. However, it is still their choice to stay there. There is a book of the damned. Those are the ones who rebelled against God from before the foundation of this earth. And there's the book of the blotted out. Those are the ones who chose Yahushua and then turned back to sin and lost their salvation. Their names are blotted out. Now, Joyce says she has studied this. She says God laid it on her heart to give that message. Then why did she tell her audience that it's possible to get their names blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life by living in willful sin? Do you really think God wouldn't want you to know that? It's actually not a hard statement to make or prove. I've said it many times. What's her problem with stating the truth? As popular as she is, you'd think many people would listen to her. She's been studying for 45 years, but she sure is a slow learner. Or, or maybe she's a traitor who sold out to the devil. So thinking about the rewards you're going to get is, is fun and encouraging. But before jumping the gun, make sure you're still living holy and obedient to God in reality. Joyce is focused on being unselfish and helping others. That sounds good and great, but Yahushua said the first and greatest commandment is to love Yahweh with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's putting Yah first. Second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's think about why the $20 million private jet preacher would tell her audience not to be selfish and help others. Is it really to help others or is she using that as a cover for her own greed? In reality, the majority of the money given to her enriches herself and her family. She wants you to be unselfish and help her. That's not the example Yahushua gave. And if money was the goal, preaching is not the career choice for you. Because obviously you cannot serve God and money. Joyce makes the mistake of saying we are good. That's not true. Even Yahushua said that. No human is good, only God is good. So throw that idea out with the trash. With maturity, you will never think that you are a good person because you absolutely know better. This is humanist thinking. Humanists believe that humans are good. The Bible says a human's righteousness is as filthy rags and that we are inherently evil. Without the light of Yeshua, a human has no boundaries for evil. And if we are good, then why do we even need a savior? According to the Bible, this is a liar. The one that says that we're good and have not sinned. Though she did not use the words, we have not sinned, she did slyly still add that in. We are good. Still, that's making God a liar. Because he says that all of us were born in sin. And if all of us are born in sin, that means not one of us is good. Even his word says, not one is good, not one is righteous. When you die, if you are saved that you are covered in the blood of Yeshua Mashiach, and you stay that way so long as you live holy, we as humans make mistakes, but a saved person does not make it a habit to sin if you have been doing your best. And this that I have explained is what that looks like. Then when you die or are martyred, you will have peace and no fear of death at all. You will be ready to go home. All the concern for your loved ones go away. It's total peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Those who are saved do not fear death or judgment. I know I spoke of the category of people who are deceived. And we'll be okay with dying only to hear those words depart from me. I never knew you. But you know exactly what pleases God and what he hates is written in the Bible. So take it seriously. Don't play around with sin. You also know it's your choice to change or deceive yourself. Either way, you know you've been convicted. Everyone has been convicted and taught by God in one way or another throughout their life, even the wicked ones. Ultimately, whatever Yah has to say to you will not really be a surprise. First John four sixteen. We know how much Yahweh loves us and we have put our trust in his love. Yahweh is love and all who live in love live in Yah and Yah lives in them. And as we live in Yah, our love grows more perfect so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Yahushua HaMashiach in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love Yah, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we cannot see. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. First John 5.10 All who believe in the Son of Yah know in their hearts that their testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. And this is what Yahweh has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have God's son does not have life. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and Yahweh will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I am not saying you should pray for those who commit it. 
all wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that Yahweh's children do not make a practice of sinning, for Yahweh's son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of Yahweh and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. We know that the son of Yahweh has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Yoshua HaMashiach. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. Everyone who believes that Yahushua is the Mashiach has become a child of Yahweh. And everyone who loves the father loves his children too. We know we love Yahweh's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. All praise, honor, and glory for this message goes to the Holy Trinity, Abba Yahweh, Yahushua, and the Ruach HaKodesh, a.k.a. Shekinah Glory, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit. Remember, Remember the, the Lord, Lord chastises, chastises, which is to correct those he loves. If this message is a blessing to you, like and subscribe and share with someone you love.